Most automakers claim that their road-going cars are byproducts or extensions of their purpose-built race cars. This car, however, and its unique chassis design wasn't initially proven on a racetrack. The technology and engineering that allowed for this car to exist and for it to be such a dominant force on track came from the skies over Berlin in the thick of World War II. The RAF had fueled a new, lightweight twin-engine plane to essentially serve as a high-speed bomber within their arsenal. This plane was the de Havilland Mosquito, and its claim to fame that allowed it to be such an important weapon in the Allied arsenal was its unique wooden airframe, which served as the basis for one ex de Havilland engineer and his business partner to build their iconic wood-framed sports car which would end up having one of the longest and most fascinating production runs of any car. This is the story of the Marcos GT, the wood-framed British wonder. We pick up this story in post-World War II England with two men, Frank Costin and Jem Marsh. Frank was the ex de Havilland engineer who had a knack for aerodynamic design from his aviation days. He was letting his aerodynamic design knowledge out to other companies like Lotus and Van Wall for their racing cars. It was after this that he got involved with Jem Marsh, who had previously founded a company called Speedex, which manufactured parts and even bodies for the Austin 7. In 1959, the two of them would go ahead to found Marcos Engineering, cleverly enough naming the company after the first three letters in each of their names. With this newly found venture, their first order of business was none other than to go racing. It was here that Marcos would first use their unorthodox wood chassis design with their first racing car, heavily inspired by the Mosquito airplane. This new chassis design would be a full plywood design and it can be seen here on screen. This first new experimental race car was named the Zylon. And now I know what you're thinking, this might be one of the most hideous creations to ever enter your eyesight. But there was a reason why the Zylon was so ugly. And that was because Jem, one of the founders of the company, was quite tall, and the roof line had to be high enough for him to be able to actually drive the car on track. But behind the eyesore of its exterior design, the Marcos Zylon was actually incredibly lightweight and saw some pretty good racing success when driven by the likes of Jem, Jackie Stewart, and other qualified drivers. Powered by the inline four-cylinder that sat behind a period Ford 105E, this little one-liter pushrod engine produced 40 horsepower and 52 foot-pounds of torque. But this new car, thanks to its lightweight plywood construction, only weighed like a thousand pounds, which made it insanely tossable and lightweight for its class. The only hurdle that this car faced from a commercial viability lens, though, was the looks. So the Marcos team went and redesigned the car with the help of the Adams Brothers, who were the designers that were brought in after just nine Zylons were built. They reworked the roofline of the Zylon heavily and ended up creating what they called the Luton Gullwing, which was a considerably better looking rendition of the car that featured most notably gullwing doors, and it still was able to offer the extra headroom needed, but now it just did so in a far more visually appealing package. It almost kinda looks similar in fact to a low drag Jaguar E-Type. Around 30 of these cars were made, with a few of them even being sold as road going cars, not just race cars. Before another design iteration happened with the Fastback. Now this was the last iteration of the initial cars before the full launch of the road-going Marcos 1800 GT in 1964, which did share a lot of the Fastback's initial styling cues, just toned down for road-going use. But 1964 was when everything changed for the brand. Five years later, after the founding of Marcos, the Marcos 1800 GT was unveiled, and it took the general public by storm, largely because of what it represented and its insane offering as a car from such an unknown company. At just 43 inches tall, the Marcos 1800 was incredibly low slung, and it looked more like a Jaguar than it did an MG. To this point, Marcos hadn't even built 100 cars yet, but then the 1800 GT 
came out of the gate and offered some truly amazing specs from such a small brand. Using the Volvo P1800's 1.8 liter pushrod inline 4 with twin Stromberg carbs, the Marcos 1800 made a respectable 110 horsepower for its 1600 pound total curb weight, which was largely still thanks to that plywood chassis. And power was put down through a 5 speed manual transmission with an electronic overdrive. The Marcos 1800s also featured a rather unusual for the price point, the Dion rear suspension setup which helped mitigate the unsprung weight of a traditional live axle setup, while the front suspension was heavily based off the Triumph Herald on the early cars. Disc brakes were fitted to the front of the Marcos 1800 and drum brakes were out in the rear. 0-60 to 60 happened in a brisk 9 seconds and the GT topped out at around 115 miles per hour, which was pretty great for the new kid on the block but that was still all part of the problem that these new cars faced. See, with Marcos being a relatively new company without much actual production history, it was always going to be difficult to sell cars in the beginning. There's just no way to get around that. But with the 1800 GT and its Dadion axle and Volvo powertrain, it was marketed at an MSRP of 1,500 Great British Pounds, or 4,200 US dollars in 1964 money. This made the Marcos considerably more expensive than the Triumph TR4, for example, which cost around 1,000 pounds, or 2,800 US dollars. And remember, Triumph was a more established name. Marcos was struggling to sell these cars at the higher price point. By 1966, just over 100 GTs had been built and they weren't selling quickly. So they needed to make a few concessions to cut costs down, which they were able to do all the way down to 1300 Great British Pounds or $3,600. And to lower the cost of the car, Marcos ditched the Volvo four-cylinder and replaced it with a 1.5 liter Ford inline four which later became a 1.6 or a 1.65 liter version. And they also removed the Dadion rear suspension setup for a traditional live axle of a Ford variety, as well as some other interior tweaks to save on price. And these changes paid off because now these newer, cheaper versions were great sellers for Marcos. The 1500 GT, 1600 GT, and 1650 GT sold around a few hundred or so cars amongst the late 60s, and 1968 saw the introduction of some even better engine options for the GT, including the odd Ford Essex 2.0-liter V4 engine and the first six-cylinder option for the GT, which was the Essex V6, which made a range-topping 140 horsepower. But it was here in 1969 where things would take a very different turn for the Marcos cars. By this time, management had determined that the very thing that made these Marcos cars so lightweight, unique, and competitive as race cars had to be thrown away in order to improve the chances of commercial success for the road cars. The signature plywood chassis was now gone and replaced with a steel version for the rest of the Marcos GT's production run. But the brand did have a few more tricks up their sleeve that, as you'll soon see, made up for the departure of the wood chassis. With the steel chassis Marcos GTs came the era of the six-cylinder cars, particularly the Essex Ford 3.0-liter V6 as the most popular power plant, with other six-cylinders being available, such as the 3.0-liter Volvo inline six, and even a handful of Triumph 2.5-liter inline sixes as well. These six-cylinder cars represented the next batch of just shy of 500 Marcos GT cars, making their way to the market from 1969 to 1971. Albeit without their signature wood frame, the newer, larger displacement engine options helped solve any power-to-weight ratio differences from the newer steel chassis cars and actually made a lot of them overall faster. The cars were starting to sell well, US exports were also now occurring, and things were looking good for Marcos. So much so that they expanded their factory to a new location in 1971 to support their increased sales volume, and that would give them room to grow in the future. However, this was when disaster would strike. 
The seemingly lucrative U.S. export market proved to set off a chain reaction of insolvency that would wipe out all the brand's growth and momentum. Some U.S. cars were getting kicked back to the U.K. as they allegedly were not meeting the U.S. regulations to be imported, even though the U.S. Marcos GTs did already undergo a series of changes specifically for that. This posed a major problem for Marcos at the worst time ever for them. They had taken on leverage and they were doing all this to grow with the new factory. But these export problems caused significant financial strain with those 20 to 30 cars that were affected. And when compounded with the actual cost of the factory, Marcos had to close its doors in 1971. And the company went dormant for years. But then it was revived and the next chapter of our story begins some 10 years later in 1981. See, over the 10-year dormant period, not much happened, except for Jem Marsh, who, if you remember, was one of the original founders. He bought the Marcos name back in 1976, and this was part of his five-year plan to bring the brand back from the dead in 1981 with some exciting new models, as well as some familiar faces. Initially, upon bringing back the Marcos GT, the existing six-cylinder and four-cylinder variants were now available as kit cars to be built by the customer using the initial engine types as they were still relatively easy to find, as well as some new power plants as well, like the Ford Cologne V6 or even the inline four from the Pinto. It's estimated that around 100 of these cars were produced, almost all of them in kit car form but for the first few years, this gave Marcos some of the capital that they needed to be back in business. Then, in 1984, the first new Marcos product offering in over a decade was here. Enter the Marcos Mantula. This car ushered in a new era for the classic design, which now began to take on a progression similar to the Porsche 911. By keeping the same core design and just slightly iterating and evolving it every few years. But the greatest evolution happened under the hood. Gone were the plethora of old engine choices, and in there sat a new one. And this engine was the formidable Rover 3.5 liter V8, or as most of us know at stateside, as the cousin of the aluminum Buick 215 V8. This engine really ended up taking England by storm at this time, and it was easy to see why looking at the new Marcos Mantula. With this V8 under the hood, power was increased to a record 190 horsepower and over 200 foot-pounds of torque, which meant that the Mantula, which was still a super lightweight car, could now rip off a 0-60 to time in the mid to high 5 second range. And it was also now much livelier in the lower RPMs thanks to the torque of the V8, which was backed up with a more apt 5-speed manual transmission. Other quality of life changes were also made, such as a slightly upgraded interior and the eventual introduction of an independent rear suspension setup. The Mantulas were also sold mainly as kit cars, starting in 1984, with their production stretching all the way to 1992, and they were also available as roadsters or coupes. Total estimates say that just under 300 of these cars were built in coupe and spider format, with an overwhelming majority of them being sold as kits, although a handful apparently were sold fully assembled. This new Mantula seemed like the perfect iteration for Marcos, but with all these new quality of life changes, the car, even in kit form, was still pretty expensive. So in an effort to not lose out on the price-conscious buyers, Marcos then launched the Martina in 1991. The Martina was a lower-priced entry that used the running gear from a Ford Cortina underneath, including the powertrain and pretty much all the suspension bits to keep them more affordable. They just bolted up to the Marcos body. These cars entered production in 1991 and were killed off in 1993 to make room for the newest flagships in the long line of the Marcos GT cars. These new cars were the Montaras and the LM series cars with the major difference being that these new cars were nearly now all factory built. Marcos had done a complete 180, and they now wanted to be cemented again as a manufacturer and not just a kit car company. The Montara was the next evolution for the road-going cars, featuring a reworked body with more aggressive wheel arches to give the car a more muscular 90s aesthetic. 
The Rover 3.5 V8 was now also replaced with the 3.9 liter fuel injected variant. The interior had further revisions made to modernize it, and the car's suspension was overhauled as well. Think of the Montara as the wide-body version of a Porsche 911, and think of the Mantula as the contemporary, narrow-body Porsche 911. And just like with Porsche, Marcos knew they needed racetrack success to elevate their brand appeal. The early Marcos GTs were very successful race cars in their own right, and over 20 years later, Marcos wanted a piece of that action again, and they would do so with their LM500 and LM600 race cars. These cars competed in GT racing from 1994 to 1996, and actually won the entire British GT car championship in 1995, as well as racing in the grueling 24 hours of Le Mans, and believe it or not, placing 7th in their class. These race cars spawned a series of limited road-going cars that would be sold alongside the race cars, all of which featured heavily reworked bodies indicative of what would have been seen on the actual competition cars. These were the LM400 and LM500s, with the numbers in their name referring to the displacement of the Rover V8 that was in them, which was now up to 5 liters and sitting around 300 horsepower in the road car variants. And if you're listening to this, you might be thinking, wow, it sounds like Marcos really started to hit their stride here with these V8 cars. And you would be right, for a short time that is. Things quickly started to unravel for Marcos again financially, with the introduction of their newest two iterations of the Mantaras. The Manta Ray, which was really just a Mantara that got a facelift, and the new Mantis which was the next iteration of the LM series road cars that now under the hood featured the Ford Quad Cam 4.6 liter V8, which was still a rev happy aluminum V8 unlike the prior Rover unit. It just had more to give in terms of power, starting off at 305 horsepower and being capable of well over 400 when supercharged. On paper, these new models sounded great, but Marcos' sales numbers told a very different story. Between these top-of-the-line LM cars, the Mantis, the Manta Ray, and any other small limited production niche models, Marcos sold just under 300 of these cars altogether. And now that they were producing all these cars and selling them as turnkey vehicles, their expenses were also considerably higher, which doomed Marcos to repeat themselves and fall into bankruptcy again by 2000. In 2002, there was another attempt to revive the now-dead brand, with Gem Marsh's backing, with a new line of Marcos cars, with the TS250, TS500, and planned TSO. However, only a handful of these cars were built before the company went under yet again for the last time, putting the nail in the coffin for the iconic Marcos GT and all of the variants that it spawned over its long roller coaster of a life all of which stemmed from an unlikely World War II bomber and its unorthodox construction giving way for a couple industrious men in the British countryside to build their revolutionary sports car. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, we would greatly appreciate it if you could drop a like and also share this video with other enthusiasts. Also, please make sure that you are subscribed to the Rare Cars YouTube channel and smash that notification bell for more documentary style videos just like this on the world's most interesting cars. Until next time, enthusiasts.